Greetings everyone. This is Daniel Gregg again. And on uh, this time I'm going to talk about um, Luke 16.16. 16. And I've written a paper on this verse and related text to it. Um, you can find it online. TorahTimes.org. Okay, and then let's see if we can bring up the actual address here right at the top a fine print right up there so anyway if you can't see it i think i'll post it online in the in the editing afterward okay so luke 16 16 is um, one of the key texts or one of the texts used by dispensationalists to say that there's an age of law and grace. And it's ba I'll tell you what the King James says here. Um, the King James says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. So you can see how they would say that an age of law ended and an age of grace began. So how is the house of Israel supposed to respond to this text? What's our, what's our apologetic for explaining why the law hasn't come to an end? Why the Torah hasn't come to an end? Okay, so the translators and theologians, that's my... Um, way of saying the scribes and the Pharisees, because you know the scribes um, were the copyists who copied the scripture, and then the Pharisees were the teachers or the theologians over Israel. So our modern day scribes and Pharisees are the translators, the translators and the theologians. All right. So the translators and the theologians are modern scribes and Pharisees say the law spanned from Moses to John the Baptist and that the age of grace began with Jesus. Okay, the reason I mentioned the translators and the theologians is because both the translation and the theology are false teachings. Okay, so the King James translation is wrong, and also the theology associated with it is incorrect. Okay, so let's take up the theology first, this idea that there's an age of grace and an age of law before it in which, um, well, apparently no grace, I guess. Um, but this is what dispensationalists believe. Okay, so probably the... A1 criteria for grace would be, I would say that would be forgiveness of sins, don't you think? If we can find forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament, then we will have found grace. And the other criteria I think we can find is we if we find God having mercy, um, we will also find grace if we find him having mercy. Okay? So, I'm going to quote you from the King James again, from Leviticus 4.20, and not because I agree with everything in the translation, but because it illustrates the point I'm making. So this is from Leviticus 4.20. And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this, and the priest shall make atonement for them. And it it shall be forgiven them. Okay, so this refrain, and it shall be forgiven them, is repeated multiple times in this section of, of Leviticus. Okay, so how can we say that there's no, no grace here if there's forgiveness of sins? Okay, so we also have another witness, this time again from the King James Version. Now, I'm quoting from King James not because it's a translation, but because it's probably the most widely recognized starting place 
and most familiar translation. Um, the most widespread accepted translation, I would say. Um, so, I'm quoting from Exodus 26. Okay, this is from the Ten Commandments, from the Ten Words passage. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Wow. So the Hebrew word underneath the word mercy here is, is hesed. Okay, and it means loving kindness or favor. Well, that's, that's grace. Loving kindness, mercy, that's grace. Okay, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. All right. So the theology of an age of grace and, or an age of law followed by an age of grace actually isn't correct. Okay. So our forgiveness and mercy grace. Well, you can answer that question. Well, what if they're not? If they're not, then when the same words are used by Yeshua and his emissaries after John the Baptist, we would have to doubt them because if it doesn't mean grace or forgiveness and mercy in the covenant of old, then what would it mean when the emissaries wrote the words down? Okay. How would we be able to trust, um, how, how can we trust those words to mean what they say in, in the new age? Okay, so we go back to this verse, I'll, I'll quote it again. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth, presseth into it. Seems like a open and shut case, at least... That's what the translators and theologians want you to think. Okay, but we've only discussed the, the theological problem with this. So now we got to get down to the translation. Okay, so just a few remarks on the translations I read here from the King James. Um, just in passing, the translation to make an atonement is incorrect in Leviticus 4.20. Okay, it means to declare to be a purging or to pro proclaim a purging. Okay, so this is a pial in Hebrew of the verb of the verb kapar. Okay, pial is kippur. Okay, or kippur, kippur. And it means to a pial is used in a declarative sense. Okay, to make to be to declare to be or to pronounce. So if the priest pronounces someone unclean, that's a that's a declarative verb form, a declarative pial, okay? And he's you know, he's already he's already clean or unclean before the priest makes the pronouncement, but the pronouncement is an official declaration or taking notice of it. So this is atonement means to declare to be a purging or a cleansing. A wiping out, okay. So that's that's not what people usually assume the word atonement means in English, okay. And there's very very little teaching on the correct meaning of atonement. All right. So let's turn the page here. Okay. So the other translation that we need to I would take note of in Exodus 26 is where it says um, unto thousands. And actually, the sense that we should put on that is under the thousandth generation. Okay, and that's made plain by parallel texts. All right, but we're not going to go into these matters now because it's, it's beside the point. The point was um, that, the, that the scriptures of old teach, teach grace. They teach forgiveness and mercy. Okay, so the translators and the theologians... Um, have corrupted the scripture in many places through their many reinterpretations and mistranslations. So they are the scribes and the Pharisees. And I could also mention a verse from Jeremiah somewhere. It says, Behold, the false pen of, pen of the scribes. Um, okay, they've corrupted the scripture with their pens. Okay, so let's... 
Let's put up a correct translation of Luke 16, 16 here, and then see what we can make of it. All righty, we're at 10 minutes. Okay. So this is from the Good News of Messiah, Luke 16, 16. And um, my translation is not the only translation that puts it this way, but it's one of the very few. Okay, and I'll explain it. The law and the prophets until John have prophesied. Okay. From that time, the good news of the kingdom of the Almighty is getting proclaimed, and all carry out an attack against it. It is yet easier work for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Okay, so you will notice, if you look at a Greek text, you will see that the word, the verb, is implied in the text. Okay, so you can put it, it goes in a different spot in the verse here. To repair the text, I have, I have to supply the word prophesied, okay, based on Matthew eleven thirteen, 13, and the reading of Codex Beza, okay, for this text. There's also another Greek text with the deleted word preserved, as well as some Latin text. Okay. Also, verbal texts in Greek and Hebrew often have an impl implied pronoun, usually it. Okay. So, the law and the prophets until John have prophesied. You could say the law and the prophets have prophesied up to this point. Okay. Well, up to the point that there's a fulfillment of the prophecy, right? Okay. The corruption, okay, so here's the context of the passage. The corruption of Israel by money was predicted in both the Torah and the prophets. So what do we find in Luke 16? The scribes and the Pharisees were lovers of money, okay? And because this was so, they exalted what was glorious in human eyes, but what was abomination in the eyes of the Almighty. Okay, so when the, and this is prophesied in Torah, I'll show you. When the blessing came upon Israel, Israel's heart turned to their treasure and they forgot the Most High. And they went after false gods. But the warning is there in Torah that when the blessing and the abundance comes upon you, that if Israel were to turn their eyes toward their wealth, then they would forget the Almighty. Okay, so that's, that's the root of the problem we're talking about here. Okay, also the shepherds traded sheep for money. So the sheep traders in, in the book of Zechariah. Okay, so this is what the immediate context in Luke 16 is about. Okay, so now I can explain the correct theology. It is evident from the differing context in Matthew 11. And remember from Matthew 11, 13, when we, we pick up the word prophesied. Okay, in a quasi-parallel passage. So it's evident from these different contexts um, that the phrase is an oft-repeated trope. In other words, Luke, Matthew 11 and Luke 16 aren't reporting on exactly the same occasion, but on an occasion where the same ideas were repeated, okay? So a trope is something that's it's repeated over again, okay? So the law and the prophets prophesied it, okay? So anytime, um, or the law and the prophets predicted it, okay? The saying would be applied to whatever thing that had been prophesied was seen to be coming true in the context of each usage. Okay, so what did the Law and Prophets predict until John the Baptist? The Prophets and the Law predicted the coming of Messiah. So did, the John, so did John the Baptist. When Messiah came true, the prediction came true. But they did not just predict that Messiah would come up until John, they also predicted that great conflict with evil would happen when Messiah came. Okay, to understand this point, we have to consider 
the two comings of Messiah, a first and a second, and that there are two comings of Eliyahu. Okay, the first representing the spirit of Eliyahu. Okay, that would be John the Baptist. And the second being Eliyahu himself. Both times, Eliyahu is the last prophet before the coming of Messiah. Okay, so I'm going to pause this because we're going to get cut off and then we'll restart it. All right, we can pick up here again. All right, so where were we at here? Okay, so the, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Eliyahu, or the spirit of Elijah, okay, because he was the forerunner to Messiah. And if you remember from the, um, the book of Malachi, it says, I will send you Eliyahu the prophet before the day of the Lord. So Eliyahu still comes, to be sure. He's one of the two witnesses. But he, he, he's the last prophet, along with Moses, the return of Moses, Moses and Eliyahu both return to bear witness to the testimony of Yeshua and bear witness to the Torah for those who keep the commandments of the Almighty. Okay, so both times Eliyahu is the last prophet before the coming of the Messiah. So the Torah and the prophets are predicting the ultimate spiritual and physical war. The war began at the first coming of Messiah. Okay, so it talks about those who assault the kingdom of God, or carry out an attack on the kingdom of God. So when Messiah Yeshua came and, and the fulfillment of his conflict between the sheep traffickers and himself um, came to a climax, okay, it was, it was fulfilled, the passages that predict us. Okay, resulting in his death also. The war began at the first coming of Messiah with the war over the souls of mankind. So we're in the phase of the war now where the conflict is over the souls of mankind. Who will they be loyal to? Will they follow Messiah Yeshua? Okay, or are they going to follow Satan? Okay, and the war will end at the second coming with the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, so it will turn, it will become a very physical war in the end. When Messiah came the first time, the spiritual war began, which was only a prediction before then. In other words, up through John, um, the war that would begin with Messiah over the souls of mankind was only predicted. Okay, so this is the kingdom of God coming near. Okay. And so, again, when Messiah has put down all opposition, what was only a prediction up through the two witnesses will become a reality. Okay, so instead of an age of law and an age of grace, we have an age of prediction and an age of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is near, and this, and this age is, Okay, and this is the age in which one should be cleansed of their sin. Okay, so this is the conflict over sin in us. And accept the writing of the Torah on our hearts, because the day of judgment is coming. So, the first coming is to rescue Israel, to ransom Israel. The second coming is to restore Israel from the nations. Okay, so now in the immediate context of Luke... What is Messiah referring to that was prophesied? Well, I already told you, but I'm going to repeat it. Um, he is referring to the predictions about the corruption of the religious leadership of Israel, whom John called a brood of vipers, or a nest of snakes, another way, and warned of the coming judgment. Okay, they were lovers of money. That was their main vice, okay. They find that the people were hungry for spiritual truth, and but they also corrupted themselves with money. 
Okay, and also corrupting the message on that basis. Scripture both preaches on this theme and predicts the conflict between them and the coming Messiah, who will be the one shepherd. So if you read the passage in Ezekiel about the corrupt shepherds um, that are going to be, they're going to be made to stop feeding the sheep because they're not teaching what the one shepherd, they're not following the one shepherd. Messiah's enemies are assaulting and warring against the kingdom of heaven from within and without. Okay, so I'm talking about the religious deep state here that calls itself either Christianity, the translators and theologians, or Judaism, their translators and theologians. Okay, so it is at this date, so, so it is at this day, okay, so this conflict is still going on. The law and prophets until Eliyahu predict. After Eliyahu is finished, Messiah will stand up and deliver Israel. So I'm talking about the second coming here. Eliyahu himself is going to come before Messiah's second coming. Okay, first, first Eliyahu is only one in the spirit and power of Eliyahu. And this figure of speech, you know, if somebody acts in the character of another person, will say, oh, he's a Moses, or he's an Ezra, or he's a Gideon. Okay, if he's a, a, a mighty warrior. Okay, so people can be lionized under the name of their biblical archety archetype. So this is, this is how John the Baptist is being called Eliyahu. It means he was in the spirit and nature of Eliyahu. Okay, but Eliyahu himself still comes. Okay. So, after Eliyahu is finished, Messiah will stand up to deliver Israel. And those false shepherds who teach that grace and law are separate ages, if they do not repent, are going to find themselves thrown out of the kingdom. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of tie this in um, with some other texts here, uh, because I want to give a more overall um, context here rather than just a isolated verse okay on this theme okay so from Messiah's and you may recognize the scriptures um, that I'm paraphrasing here okay um, and we can, I can discuss the translation of them at some other time but I want you to get the concept okay so from Messiah's plenty we have received grace on top of grace so see if you can guess where that comes from because the Torah was given through Moses, okay? So, the present age of grace follows on the former age of grace. All grace and all faithfulness come through Yeshua the Messiah, okay? So, if the Torah teaches grace, then what about the curses in Torah? Remember the Deuteronomy passage about curses for breaking the law? Okay, so at the present time, there is a season of grace for Israel until the promised seed comes. Now, I'm talking about his second coming, okay, when there will be judgment. See, right now, there's a season of grace for people to repent. Okay, when the Messiah comes the second time, he will bring judgment with him, and evil will be removed from Israel. For the judgment is announced to be by Messiah. Do you remember that the Father has turned all judgment over to Messiah Yeshua? Okay, and it will be through his holy messengers, the angels, who shall remove the wicked from the kingdom. Okay, so remember the parables where he said that his messengers would go and remove and root out all the evil from his kingdom. Okay, so he is the mediator between the Most High and men being both the Almighty Son and the Son of Man. It is he who will cleanse the evil from Israel. Okay. And that, and that day I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. Okay. It doesn't just mean forgiveness. It also means actual sin. So see if you can guess what I'm paraphrasing here. What about the curses in the Torah? 
At the present time, there is a season of grace for Israel until the promised seed comes. When the Messiah comes a second time, he will bring judgment with him, and evil will be removed from Israel. For the judgment is to be announced by Messiah, and it will be through his holy messengers, the angels, who shall remove the wicked from his kingdom. All right, so that's, I'll give you a clue. That's from a specific passage in Paul. Let's see if you can figure out where it comes from. You can put it down below in the comments if you can figure it out. Um, he is the mediator between the Most High and men, being both the Almighty Son and the Son of Man. So he identifies both with God and with man. Okay, is he who will cleanse Israel from sin? Okay, and so I'll finish up. I'll finish up with this. Okay, so in that day, Messiah will have made new the covenant of old and his law will be written on everyone's heart okay so the covenant of old is the berit olam so one of the ways of translating berit olam is covenant of old or everlasting covenant but for obvious reasons i like to state covenant of old because it's a covenant of old that will that is new made it is new made Okay, and renewed in Messiah's blood. Okay, and his law will be written on everyone's heart. Okay, so that's that completes our apologetic for Luke 16, 16 here. And we see that we just have to supply the word prophesied and look at the overall context. Now, um, if we were to say the law and the prophets were until John, and they ended well that's kind of strange because it's it's like a it's like something that doesn't fit the context at all it's just a statement um out of the blue so to speak in the narrative of luke 16 but once we understand that he's talking about the conflict that was prophesied between yeshua and the and the authorities between yeshua and the sheep traffickers yeshua and the one is the one shepherd and the false shepherds um, who were lovers of money and just traded the sheep for profit. Uh, we could understand that the context fits the correction. So the correction is, um, go back here. The law and prophets until Yochanan have prophesied it. Okay, so from that time, the good news of the kingdom of the Almighty is getting proclaimed and all carry out an attack against it. So this is the conflict. Okay, the devil, the devil pulled out all stops to stop the message of the kingdom. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke or letter of the law to fail. And so there we have an affirmation of the Torah, of its continuing validity. Okay, and we know that we're talking, I'll give you a really quick illustration about fulfilling the law. Um, if I fulfill the law today to love my wife um, and to care for her, does that mean my duty to love my wife has ended? Well, no, because I have a duty tomorrow to do the same thing, so to fulfill the law of love. So we have, uh, we keep fulfilling the law of love, but it's a duty that never goes away. So we're continuously fulfilling the law of love. All right. So, the law and prophets still stand, and there's always been forgiveness all along, and God has always had mercy all along. Now, new things have come, but those new things are a better understanding of the nature of God and, and, and how he accomplishes forgiveness, or how he wants to teach it to us, and the cost of it and the cost of cleansing. There is fuller revelation on that. Okay, so thank you for listening. Daniel Gregg, over and out.